Well, today is Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. And Christianity, our entire faith, is based upon this one belief that Jesus died for our sins and that he rose again. The Apostle Paul explained it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if Christ had not been raised, then our faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. 2 Corinthians 5 completes the foundation of our faith. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to become a curse for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that we might receive salvation. Jesus died in our place and all our sins were laid on him. You know, when God looked down that day, he didn't see a sinless son, Jesus, on that cross. What he saw were all the sins of the world nailed to that cross that morning. Nailed to the cross. So this morning I want us to nail our sins to the cross. If you look at the back of your bulletin, there's some post-it notes. So if there's anything that you're struggling with right now, if there's any sin that you keep, it just keeps recurring and, you know, try as you might, your body is too weak, and you keep falling prey to that sin, maybe your sin is forgiveness, you need to forgive somebody, maybe your sin is bitterness, maybe it's anger, maybe it's pride, arrogance. If you've got a sin that you'd like to give it to Jesus today to take that curse away from you, I want you to write it down and put it on this cross. Now, nobody's going to look at what you write down. I've got pens on the back side of, of the pews. Put them out today. If you need, if, you need, if you've got a whole bunch of things, I've got more post-it notes. You can come up and grab a few more. If you are afraid of somebody reading what you have, don't even write it down. Just use the initials, the initials of what you want to put down. Because it's just between you and God. It's just between you and Jesus. It's not between you and anybody in this room today. And then just bring it on up to the cross. And just put it on the cross this morning. Whenever you're ready. anything any sin that you're just having a difficulty you just you keep falling prey to that sin you keep committing it anger need more just put it on the cross hopefully this cross is going to be covered pretty soon so if you need a pen, let me know. We'll get a pen to you. Just feel free to just walk up. Nail your sins to the cross. Just one person. That's my man. No, I said if you need more, I've got a whole pad here. I put two on the back of your bulletin. Yeah, girl. There's no need to carry such baggage through your life. Put it on the cross this morning. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, then 
And if Christ is not alive, then we believers still remain under the dominion and the curse of sin and death. Everything that you're writing down and putting on the cross, you are still held accountable for those if Jesus did not die, if he did not become resurrected from the dead, overcome dead, overcome death, overcome sin, overcome the world. And our faith is just useless. Because there is no power on earth. There is nothing in this world that can deliver us from God's curse on us. Because he is just. He is just in condemning us to death for our sins. And without the resurrection of Jesus, without his holy ministry on this earth, you know, the death of Jesus means nothing. We're still accountable. We're still accountable for all those sins that we're nailing to the cross this morning if Jesus did not die for our sins. Now you've got to realize there's a spiritual war going on. There's, there's warring going on between the spirit of life and the spirit of death. Death is the end of life. Death is the end of being. Resurrection is restoring the life which has ceased to exist. Jesus. The resurrection is the restoring of being. And resurrection is the monumentous display of God's power, and His love, and His might for each and every one of you here today. Romans 8 reassures us, it says, Nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing, <coughs> In all creation, God created everything. There is nothing that he created that will ever separate us from his love that is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Good. I've got a backside to it. So again, today is Resurrection Sunday. This Resurrection Sunday... We are going to set time aside this morning to remember the sacrifice made by our Lord and Savior. And we're going to glorify Him this morning through a reading of His Word. This is the greatest story ever told. This is the good news. Passover the sacrifice of God's perfect lamb, his son Jesus. And we're going to take the account as given in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I've taken them all because they all focus on different things, and I've put it all together today for this reading. So first, you've got your bulletin. Let's pick it up. We're going to read the joint reading for today together. Are we ready? This comes from all four Gospels. Let's read it together. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. 
that other lady? It was late Thursday evening during Passover week. Jesus went with his disciples to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, pray that you will not give in to temptation and fall asleep. Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he was anguished and distressed and he told Peter, James, and John, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went about a stone's throw and knelt down with his face to the ground and he prayed. My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And then an angel from heaven appeared and gave him strength. Jesus prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. And then he returned to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me for even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to the temptation to sleep. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And then Jesus left them a second time and prayed. <coughs> My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to, the, to them again, he found them sleeping. For they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time. And when he came back, he said to his disciples, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man has been betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's be going. My betrayer is here. Judas the betrayer knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and the Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him, now with blazing torches and lanterns and swords and clubs, they arrived in the Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. <coughs> Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and then he gave Jesus the kiss. Jesus fully realized all that was about to happen, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazarene, they replied. And Jesus said, I am he. And as he said that, they all drew back and they fell to the ground. Once more he asked them, who are you looking for? And they again replied, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am he. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. When the other disciples saw that what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? And then Peter drew his sword and slashed off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? And he would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? And then Jesus touched Malchus's ear, and he was healed. 
Jesus then spoke to the leading priests and the captains of the guard and the elders and said, I am, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why did you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this is your moment. This time is the time that the power of darkness reigns. And at that point, the disciples deserted Jesus and they ran away. The soldiers, their commanding officer and the temple guards, tied Jesus up and they took him to the home of Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, Caiaphas. Peter followed Jesus, as did another disciple. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest and was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard when they dragged Jesus through the gates. Peter had to stay outside. But the disciple spoke to a servant watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. And the woman asked Peter, You're one of his disciples, aren't you? No, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards, they made a fire, and they stood around it, warming themselves. And Peter stood with them, warming himself, as he waited to see what was about to happen to Jesus. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about what he had been teaching his disciples. And Jesus replied, Everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and the temple where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards slapped Jesus across the face. That is no way to speak to the high priest, he said. Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why are you beating me? The guards began mocking and beating Jesus. They blindfolded him and they said, prophesy to us, who hit you that time? Then Annas bound Jesus again and with ropes and sent him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Outside, Simon Peter was standing by the fire, warming himself, and another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around the fire, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter denied it and swore, I don't even know the man. But one of the household slaves, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, you are one of the Galileans. I'm sure I saw you out there in the olive grove with Jesus. A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. At that moment, Jesus was being led away to stand before Caiaphas, the high priest. And Jesus turned and looked over at Peter as they led him away. Suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, tomorrow morning you will deny me, even knowing me three times. And Peter left the courtyard weeping. It was now just about daybreak. All the elders and the people assembled, including the leading priests and the leaders and the teachers of religious law. Jesus was led before the high council. And many fault witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, two men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands. And in three days, I will build another made without human hands. But even then, 
they got their stories mixed up. They were not the same. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Well, aren't you going to say something? But Jesus remained silent. And he made no reply. And then the high priest asked him, I demand in the name of the living God that you tell us if you are the Messiah. Are you the Son of God? Jesus replied, I am. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then they all shouted, So are you claiming to be the Son of God? And he replied, You say that I am. And then the high priest tore his clothing to show his anger, and he yelled, Blasphemy! Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die. And they took Jesus away. Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, the teachers of religious law, the entire high council met to discuss what to do next. They bound Jesus and they led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go out, didn't go inside because it would defile them. They wouldn't be able to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went outside to them and he asked, What is your charge against this man? The priest said to Pilate, this man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. Take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish, the Jewish leaders replied. And then Pilate went back into his quarters and he called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked. And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. So you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. And then Pilate went out again and turned to the leading priest and the crowd and he said, I find nothing wrong with this man. And they became insistent. He is causing riots by his teachings. Wherever he goes, all over Judea, from Galilee to Jerusalem. So he is a Galilean? Pilate asked. And when they said that he was, Pilate sent him to Herod, Antipas, because Galilee was Herod's jurisdiction, not his. And Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. And Herod was delighted at the opportunity to meet Jesus, because he had heard all about him. He had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. And he asked Jesus question after question, but Jesus refused to answer. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law stood before Herod, and they were shouting out their accusations about Jesus. And then Herod became very angry with Jesus. Because he would not speak. And he and his soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus. Finally, they put a royal robe on him and they sent him back to Pilate. Jesus got back to Pilate. 
Pilate called all the leading priests and the religious leaders and all the people to come together and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly and I find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to me finding him innocent. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. So I will have him flogged, and then I will release him. I just forgot I meant to put this on. There we go. But the mob shouted louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified. And then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead tip whip. Scourging was a brutal form of torture. It left the back torn to ribbons, even left the rib cage exposed. And Romans, they were experts at torture. They would bring a person close to death, but they would not allow them to die. They want them to suffer in agony. Coming so close to death that they were just wishing and begging for death to come. Crucifixion was an example of that, and so was scourging. Forty lashes was a death sentence. The Romans believed that if a flogger were to appropriately administer punishment, 40 lashes, the person would die on the 40th lash. <coughs> By the 40th lash, they would die. And they determined that 39 lashes should not kill a person. So the Romans were merciful. They only gave Jesus. 39 lashes. Now the prophet Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years earlier of the Messiah being scourged. He said, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities, and the chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. So they led Jesus away to whip him, because it was by his stripes that you are healed. By his stripes, you are healed. You are healed. Ginger, you are healed. Dalton, you are healed. Robin, you are healed. Teddy, you are healed. Mike, you are healed. Carla, you are healed. Randy, you are healed. Mark, you are healed. Jill, you are healed. Rodney, you are healed. Tanya, you are healed. Becky, you are healed. Tony, you are healed. Oren, you are healed. Lee, you are healed. Ow. Nikki, you are healed. Renee, you are healed. Lexi, you are healed. Nikki, you are healed. Joy, you are healed. Glenn, you are healed. Charlotte, you are healed. Ham, you are healed. 
Isaiah. You are healed. And joy. You are healed. By his stripes. Oh. Jason, you are healed. Amen. I am healed. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Kayla, hey, you Lynn's are joy. healed. I got that joy. I got that joy. Did I get both joys? Yeah. Joy, joy, joy. Now it was the governor's custom. You're healed. <laughs> during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd. Anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas. He was a revolutionary who committed murder in an uprising. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house, that morning he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, Then what should I do with Jesus, who you call the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. And Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? And the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and he washed his hands before the crowd said, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility of your, is yours. And he released Barabbas to them. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard. And they stripped him. And they put a scarlet robe on him. Then they wove thorn branches into a crown. And they put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. And then they knelt before him and they mocked him and they taunted him. Hail, king of the Jews! And they spit on him and they grabbed the stick and they struck him in the hand with it. And Pilate went outside again to the people and said, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. They dragged Jesus out and he came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. Look, here is the man. And when they saw him, the leading priests and the temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate shouted. I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, and by our laws he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the quarters again and asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? And Jesus said, you would have no power over me unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. And then Pilate tried to release him again. But the Jewish leaders shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. 
Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down in the judgment seat. It was now just about noon. The day of preparation for Passover. And Pilate said to the people, Look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. And Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. He was now sentenced to death. So Jesus begins to carry his own cross. He's weak. He's already near death. Every step is just pure agony. He's been beaten so badly that his face is covered with bruises and welts and just open gashes. And he's bleeding profusely. Along the way, he stumbles and he falls. And the soldiers realize he's never going to make it to his execution. About that time, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming from the countryside. So the soldiers seized him, and they put the cross on him and forced him to carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. And he went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, <coughs> skull hill. Two criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. And then the soldiers nailed him to the cross.
They divided his clothes. And they threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. Then they sat down and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they are doing. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down now from the cross. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, but he can't save himself. So he is the King of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now and we will believe him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the soldiers mocked him too by offering him sour wine. And they called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Even one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Well, prove it. Prove it. Save yourself. And save us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land. It happened so suddenly. Nobody expected it. No one moved. No one spoke. The, sto the soldiers stopped their swearing. They stopped their mocking. Not a sound broke the dark silence over Skull Hill. It lasted for three hours. About three o'clock, just as suddenly as the darkness came, it disappeared. And there was panic and confusion. And then Jesus shouted out with a loud voice, Eli! Eli, lemma sabachthani! What? My God, my God, why have you abandoned? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and they thought Jesus was calling out for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran up and filled the sponge with sour wine, holding it up to Jesus. But the other said, wait! Let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. And Jesus shouted out once again, Father, I entrust my spirit to your hands. And with those words, you bring it to this last. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. Rocks split apart. And tombs opened. The Roman officer overseeing the execution and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that was happening in 
they said, truly, this man was the Son of God. It was the day of preparation. And the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there on the crosses the next day, which was the Sabbath, and a very special Sabbath because it was Passover. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering their legs be broken. And then their bodies could be taken down. One of the soldiers approached and broke the legs of the two men being crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. These things happen in fulfillment of the scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken. They will look on the one they pierced. As the evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple of Jesus, and a member of the Jewish high council, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead. So he called for a Roman officer to verify that Jesus had in fact died. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate allowed Joseph to take away the body. Joseph took Jesus' body down from the cross, and following Jewish burial tradition, he wrapped him with spices and long sheets of linen cloth. Skull Hill was very near a garden where a new tome had been carved out of the rock. And because it was the day of preparation of Passover, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. They placed his body in the tomb, and they rolled a stone in front of the entrance. This all happened on a Friday, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. And as the body was taken away to the tomb, the women from Galilee, who had been caring for Jesus, followed from behind. They saw where the tomb was and where the body was placed. And then they went home and they prepared spices and ointments. They were going to anoint his body, but by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. So by law, they rested. The leading priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate and they told him, we remember Jesus saying while he was alive that after three days I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing the body and telling everyone that he was raised from the dead. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it as best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. As the Sabbath ended very early on Sunday morning, we just missed our darkness. There we go. We've got to have Saturday in there. That's good. Okay. After the Sabbath had ended, very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, <clears throat> Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. Who will roll away the stone for us? From the entrance of the tomb, they wondered. But as they arrived, they looked up and they saw that the huge stone had already been rolled aside. And when they entered the tomb, two angels appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. And the women were terrified. 
and they bowed their faces to the ground. And one of the angels said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Jesus lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes shall not die everlasting life.